anything in that order. Hey everyone, what is up? On the right back again. And today we have a banger of a race. This is Bionicle the game, uh, any percent, no Tahu skip. Uh, this game pretty much loosely covers uh, the first Bionicle movie, Mask of Light. Um, and I think uh, both runners are ready. We can get right into it. Get the count is down on go. Three, two, one, and go. So to start off here, uh, both runners are going to be immediately saving and quitting to the menu. Uh, that's going to skip the intro cutscene. And uh, it's the only cutscene in the game that lets us do that. Uh, up next, there are some uh, tutorial text boxes. Uh, so you'll see both runners taking a uh, uh, jump to the side rocks on the left to avoid those. Uh, there is one text box that will be hit um, that's not able to be skipped RTA, but it is possible to skip in a tool assisted speedrun. This game is a uh, 3D platformer, like I said, loosely based off the Mask of Light movie. Um, it touches on some of the plot lines. Uh, in the first and final levels, uh, but the game itself covers uh, playing as the actual Toa themselves. Uh, we've got six playable Toa in various uh, Nuba upgraded or mod other original forms. Uh, originally, the game was planned to have uh, all playable as each different form, but a lot of this game was cut. Um, so we'll only be seeing two modded levels and the rest as the Nuba. Uh, this enemy right here, uh, his name is Stanley. Uh, he's a good friend. Sometimes he wants a little hug, so you just have to give him a hug and then get right in your way. Uh, now the category is no Tahu skip. Um, this level has a really obnoxious uh, skip where you can skip about, I just want to say about a third of the level. It saves roughly two minutes. Um, and basically there is a rock and a wall you can slot yourself into, and if you hold forward at the right angle, uh, Tahu will rock back and forth, and sometimes, rarely, uh, you just magically clip through the wall. Uh, there's no real consistent setup for it, and it's uh, definitely not marathon viable. Um, so since this game was last at Legothon, uh, we added it as an official category. So it's much more enjoyable to run. Up here, we're going to talk to Takua, the main character of, uh, I guess you could call it, of the Mask of Light. Um, he's going to tell us that we need to uh, collect uh, Matoran, which are little villagers in the Bionicle universe. Uh, so we can build an animal which will run on a treadmill which opens the door. Um, so normally this would be skipped in uh, in any percent category, but here we're going to go off to the right. Now there are uh, two potential skips uh, that can skip both that cutscene and the upcoming boss fight, uh, but both rely on a really, really inconsistent and very difficult uh, glitch called double jump storage, or double jump uh, refresh. Uh, basically, if you double jump and then immediately get hit, uh, within a few frames, it gives you both your single and double jump back, allowing you to get a ton of height. So you can use that early on uh, to skip over the uh, Takua cutscene trigger. And then it is possible to do it here to skip past uh, this giant Rahi, uh, but both runners uh, probably won't be going for it, because uh, again, it is very inconsistent. Uh, but this one can save up to about 10 seconds or so. Uh, so here, one of the main mechanics of uh, the game uh, is the elemental energy projectile. Uh, if you see the uh, orange bar on the top left hot icon, uh, basically you have a certain amount of energy and shots expend that energy, and then you can absorb projectiles to uh, get that energy back. Uh, there are both runners taking an intentional death. Uh, it's a small little death warp, saves a few seconds. And now we're into a room that's very infamous for uh, killing me in my runs. Uh, we call this Rahi Room. Basically, there are some uh, Nui Jaga on these pillars that they will uh, shoot down. Um, that elemental energy projectile, its intended mechanic is not to actually kill these Rahi, um, since they're infected by the Makuta's dark influence. The projectile is supposed to teleport them to safety, um, so it doesn't actually kill them. Uh, but here we're going to actually kill these Nui Jaga by smashing them with pillars. Uh, a little bit of an oversight, but that's what LEGO wanted. Uh, this area of the room can have uh, a few different outcomes after this cutscene. Uh, if you do it in the wrong order, uh, it will play this sort of victory animation that you see there on Rin's screen, uh, and it can sometimes just spawn you in the lava and kill you, and 
uh, the really well put together game. Uh, speaking of cut content, you can see there Tahu's mouth is actually moving during that cutscene, uh, even though there's no dialogue playing or no text on screen. Uh, again, just uh, another relic of something uh, cut or missing from the game. So now we're walking past the infamous wall uh, that you try to clip into in any percent. And you would normally skip all of that uh, previous section in any percent. Now we're on to one of the big RNG parts of the game. This is the bow rock fight. Uh, these guys can roll around and just not really uh, cooperate with you. Looks like we're seeing a double hit from Milk Blade. Uh, if you spam shots right at the beginning, you can actually hit them twice as they uh, earn their sort of uh, damage animation. If you get really lucky and one spawns right next to you, you can actually get three hits uh, if you hit it as it's coming out of the ground. Uh, but it's very rare to see one of those. Uh, here, both runners going to be using a uh, mechanic that's not actually uh, explicitly explained in game, uh, but we found it by uh, consulting the manual. If you press the L button, uh, your character will lock on and always face your target, so that makes the shot track much more consistent. Um, that's why you sort of see the weird strafing movement from, from both players here. It is really difficult to uh, try to manipulate these bow rock um, into going where you want to. They have a mostly random pattern, but you can kind of influence or update their pathing uh, by moving around or uh, sort of cutting them off and meeting them to where they're going to stop. Looks like we have both runner synced coming out of Tahu, which is actually awesome. Uh, here we're going to see Tahu do a little dance, and uh, we're going to get our first Mask of Light reference, which Go is going to talk about the, uh, the great Kanoe mask. I must tell the others. Uh, that Monica. boss fight also has a weird uh, delay that can happen. Even after you defeat the last bow rock, uh, sometimes the cutscene just does not start, so you can end up sitting there and waiting for over five seconds before it actually finishes. So it's the first level complete, and next we're going to be playing as Kopaka, the Toa of Ice. Um, this level is called uh, what's internally referred to as an adrenaline, adrenaline level, where uh, it's more action-heavy, exciting than just walking around and collecting Matoran. Uh, so Kapok is going to be using his shield, and we're going to see a snowboarding section. Uh, this level is uh, a little bit interesting in how you save time. The shortest path to your destination is not necessarily the fastest one. Um, whenever you get popped up into the air, you actually lose quite a bit of speed. So you'll see both runners staying grounded as much as they can, uh, taking sometimes uh, unoptimal lines in order to stay grounded as much as possible and preserve their speed. Uh, there, Rin's saving a little bit of time with a jump known as Soup Jump. Uh, there's a little bit of collision you can jump up to on the right side of the cliff, and that lets you preserve some speed. Uh, the bottom right, you'll see that uh, green and red uh, group of circles. Those are actually the Torin uh, lettering, uh, specifically numbers, and it's a timer because this section is a timed section. Uh, there is a pretty unique glitch for Kopaka. Um, by, at the start of any section, you can uh, spam the shield button, and when you land, you can sometimes hop off of the snowboard and start walking around, which is not normally intended. Uh, there are many missing animations. Uh, we haven't been able to find any sort of time save with it yet. You can skip uh, a certain section by getting off the board and walking around uh, certain cutscene and level triggers. Um, but unfortunately, it is slower because the walk speed is so much slower than on the snowboard. See, so, yeah, I see both runners here uh, staying, you know, going left and right, avoiding uh, the, the sharp slopes as they come down to the uh, final section of this part. Uh, both runners should be going for a, uh, a jump up on the left side of the cliff so that they can cut the corner. Uh, there is a way that you can start the jump earlier, take lower speed, and get more height. And you can actually jump up and around the cutscene trigger, so you can walk around this uh, area that you'll see here, see here in the cutscene. There is an unused uh, level transition that's sort of broken in the hole in the wall that the cutscene will point to, um, but it doesn't do anything besides soft lock, soft lock the game if you get there. Any hardcore Bionicle fans will be shocked to hear that Nuju is actually speaking uh, words. Normally in the Bionicle universe, he requires a translator, uh, but it seems like the developers of this game did not get that memo. 
Up next, we have our first uh, boss fight of this level. Uh, we have two uh, Barak chase sequences. Uh, basically, we'll have to get close to the Barak, hit the shield, knock it into the air, and then fire away with some projectiles. Uh, but, but first, we have the X-ray vision section. Each Toa has a unique uh, elemental or mask ability. Uh, Kopaka's has the mask of X-ray vision. I forget what the actual mask name is. Um, <laughs> But basically, on every other version of the game, uh, PlayStation, uh, Xbox, and PC, there's a really thick black fog in this area, so Kapaka needs to use his X-ray vision mask to see through it. Uh, but for whatever, whatever reason, on the GameCube version, well, which is the fastest version, uh, the fog isn't rendered, so it makes the mask largely useless. Uh, here, both runners going to be hitting a quick and easy three cycle. Um, it is technically possible to hit a two cycle by getting four shots in the beginning, uh, but it hasn't really been pulled off RTA, uh, to my knowledge. Kopaka, Toa of Ice, you have saved Up next, we're going to have I, what I believe to be the shortest uh, playable section in the run. Um, it's only for a few seconds, but it has potential for a massive two-frame time save, uh, because the uh, trigger for the next area isn't quite in a straight line, so both runners should be holding right uh, slightly, and that saves exactly two frames. Next, we have a downhill boulder section. Uh, section is uh, sort of scripted in a way where there's a minimum amount of time you have to spend in this section. Um, so you can actually get hit by one or two boulders at the beginning and not lose any time. Uh, these boulders aren't random, uh, they do have a set pattern. Um, so some runners sometimes opt to just stay on the left, whereas uh, others uh, tend to swing back and forth. Um, but there's no real right or wrong answer to the, uh, to the route you take in this session. In that really short section earlier, it is possible to use that uh, glitch that I mentioned where you can hop off the snowboard. Uh, so you can actually skip the, the cutscene trigger and walk down this section and walk around in this area in the cutscene and then you can actually go further to the next area, and the game will put you back on your board and it will function properly as if it was intended. Um, but unfortunately, it does lose probably about a minute just to, from having to walk really slowly down that hill. So up here is the Tanok boss fight, the second bow rock in the final section of this level. Uh, this has a couple different strategies you can take. Um, you can either do two hits at the beginning or three, if you choose two, you can sometimes get the second damage cycle a little, little earlier. It makes it a little more consistent, um, but three hits at the beginning and one at the end uh, does have the potential to be the fastest overall. This boss is really annoying because it does have a uh, certain vulnerability window, so sometimes you can get right up next to the boss and shield it and nothing will happen because uh, it's not able to be damaged for a few seconds. Also, if you notice in the top right, the boss icon is the wrong color. It's the one from earlier. Uh, just a small bug and a developer oversight. Very, very close for these two runners. Very good second level. And up next, we have the hardest level in the game. Incredibly precise and a lot happens, so hopefully I can explain it all properly. Uh, basically, it's a Matoran collection, like the first level. Uh, there are 13 they'll need to get. Some of them have text boxes that trigger immediately as you grab them, and some of them trigger after you touch the ground after you grab them. Uh, so they'll, they'll be stacking two Matoran text boxes uh, that trigger after you touch the ground, and that will skip one of them, so we'll see them do that uh, by clipping out of bounds and doing a glitch where they can grab a Matoran through a cage that they're supposed to break. You'll see what I mean here. But this level is by far the most broken. There are tons of out of bounds tricks. Uh, probably at least three or four in every single room. Um, the swimming, swimming physics are quite glitchy, but in the, the way that's pretty fun. Uh, so you can use it to get a lot of height um, by jumping up certain slopes. Um, those are a GameCube exclusive glitch. Um, so you see here the first one, uh, we call this one, oh, just barely missed for Milk Blade, but Rin does get it. That one is very, very hard, very tight. Um, I, I ended up naming them the Yumps, uh, because the upwards acceleration was similar to King DDD's up B in Project M, and he goes Yump when he does it, so I thought that was funny. So here Rin going for what we call Cageless, the hardest point. Um, let's see, looks like they did grab the Matoran through the cage, nice, very well done. Very difficult, and Milkblood getting it as well. 
excellent job from both runners. That is super, super difficult. Normally there are two text boxes because they grab too much Warren, but since they grab both of them in one jump without touching the ground, uh, the next time they touch the ground, only one text box played, so it skipped one of them completely. Uh, here we're going to do another out of bounds clip um, to get to the next part of the section or the next part of the level. Uh, there are two gates uh, that normally you're supposed to shoot a target and have a cutscene play to open them, um, but both gates being skipped by going completely out of bounds and around them. Uh, up here, see both runners going to be taking an intentional hit, uh, or if they're really good to try it without it, but I think both run playing it safe. Yeah, using the iframes to charge up their Nuba Blast and blast those cages. That's how you're supposed to break them. Um, and then right into another really difficult clip jump that has some weird uh, mechanics to how you can actually climb that. Um, again, doing a text box storage by uh, not touching the ground. And then when they get to the next section, it actually deloads the text box from that Matoran, skipping it entirely. So now we have three more Matoran to grab. Um, there are five in this room. Two of them are locked behind uh, energy cages, so those are quite slow, so we don't go for those. Uh, looks like Rin getting an excellent cliff jump. Milk Blade getting it as well. Wow, that is another really, really precise trick. Uh, really great levels uh, from both these runners. Uh, this level has so many difficult, really precise tricks, uh, some that I didn't even get to mention, uh, and both runners pulling it off very, very well. Uh, that is really really good i cannot understate how good that was from both runners uh so up next uh we do have a boss fight very similar to um the uh boss fight from the first level where we have multiple bow rock uh, but this time they are more difficult but thankfully we have the nuba blast ability this is i think this saves about 90 seconds it's one of the largest skips but one of the easiest uh, so as soon as they touch the ground they're going to start charging their energy and releasing it almost right away uh, that will instantly kill all of the bow rock, uh, ending the fight basically instantly. Very easy trick to do, uh, very very simple, but very big time save. I have seen them, strange new creatures, dark and the brutal. Yeah, that level has usually you end up seeing runners uh, anywhere from ten to twenty seconds uh, uh, behind after the level because it's just so easy to lose so much time. So that was really well done for both runners, again. Uh, here we have Pohatu's level. Um, he's the only level, or he, the only Toa that starts without a cutscene in his level. Um, so both runners climbing the rocks to the right and avoiding the cutscene trigger. And uh, off to the next section. Uh, they're also going to be double jumping down this hill. Uh, so if you walk down the hill, it actually slows down your horizontal momentum. Um, so you can save up to around a second to a second and a half just by jumping in this section. Uh, Pohatu here, he has the Mask of Speed. Um, unfortunately, we don't get to see him actually use it as we are falling through the ground, underground, into the mines, and we're going to see a minecart section. Uh, any LIJ1 runners uh, will recognize this from Temple of Doom. Very, very similar. Uh, we're going to be on a minecart, and there are switches they have to grab throughout the course. Sorry to drop in like this. But I can't stay. The uh, physics for this minecart are quite glitchy. Um, you'll see, uh, uh, you'll hear quite a loud sound and quite a lot of flashing through some parts, uh, because jumping lets you preserve your speed. Uh, normally, when you go uh, down a slope, your speed increases to a maximum, and then when you go up slopes, your speed decreases. But if you jump, your speed doesn't decrease. So by basically spamming jump through uh, all of the uphill sections, that'll let them keep a lot more speed. It does get quite loud, does look quite silly but it is all for the sake of speed. Uh, that first lock they're hitting to the right, uh, you're not normally supposed to hit it on that first pass through. You're normally supposed to hit it uh, right around here on the blade screen, right there. Uh, but for some reason on the GameCube version, you can just grab it early. Uh, the GameCube version does have quite a few differences from the other platforms, uh, notably faster load times. Uh, you're able to hit some much bigger jumps in, uh, in Golly's level and some other visual differences, and uh, really compressed audio as well. So up here, this part is basically as close as you can get to an auto scroll in this game. Um, you can lean left and right to keep up your energy level uh, to collect those green spheres. If you don't, uh, you will just fall off the cart and get reset to back to the beginning. Uh, there are no checkpoints here.
Uh, so coming up, we do have a uh, another uh, unique Bionicle speedrunning trick name, uh, very inventively called Pohatu Jump, where there are some uh, five obstacles we have to jump over uh, and uh, or destroy, but uh, jumping over it is much faster but much more difficult. Uh, both runners are going to be taking a slightly different strategy to how they approach it. Everyone going to be slowing down and often to shoot some of them, whereas Milk typically likes to go uh, and just outright jump all over. Uh, all five. So you can see Rin slowing down for the second one uh, and shooting the rest of them. Milk Blade does end up hitting it, uh, which is unfortunate. Doesn't lose a whole lot of time, uh, but it does if your shots don't hit, because this is a very, very well-designed video game. Definitely no issues with shot tracking whatsoever. Uh, coming up, we have a uh, short reference. If you see, oh, <laughs> blink and you miss it. There's a small little dot that flew across the screen. Uh, basically, in the Bionicle universe, there's a fruit called a Madu Nut, and there are two entries for it in the extras menu, and it's only visible on screen for about half a second in this one level. So now, coming up to the end here, uh, oh, no, into I'm another cutscene, uh, you can see some no, leftover uh, textures on Onua. The back of his head is blue. Um, for some reason, in the earlier versions of this game, Onua had a much more blue tint to him. And that seems to be a leftover texture from that. Yeah, very clean from both runners. Um, Bhakti Jump doesn't lose... Uh, I don't think that lost more than 10 seconds, so it's not the biggest deal if you do hit it. But like I said, uh, you do run the risk of hitting the axe uh, if you try to go for the faster strategy. So Ren coming into Onua's level here. Uh, this level is... Uh, it's made... Oh! <laughs> it has a few different quirks. Uh, one of them is falling rock from the ceiling. Uh, really nothing Rin could do about that there. Uh, the rock just decided to push them right into the water. Uh, but basically the main mechanic is pushing these rocks onto these switches uh, in order to open the doors. Um, for a long time this level was a huge liability on the GameCube version uh, because we'd frequently crash the game here and lose our runs and we didn't really know why. Um, but now thankfully we do know the reason. Uh, I was able to find it through uh, a completely unrelated uh, skip that I was trying to find uh, in a different level. But basically, when you use your shield ability, uh, you can absorb projectiles, and that's the sort of intended mechanic, uh, and that adds to your uh, elemental energy bar. But if you uh, shield when right next to certain enemies, specifically the Hodo bugs, the small uh, yellow and blue bugs, and the Nui Jaga, those blue scorpion looking guys, uh, if you shield next to them, uh, it plays a sort of electric hiss sound effect. And whenever you play that sound effect more than about two or three times, uh, it can mess with the game's music. And then the next time you hit a load zone, the game will crash if you do it too often. Um, like I said, very well designed video game. Uh, that glitch only really a problem on the GameCube version. Um, there are other ways the game can crash, uh, but uh, both of those uh, potentials have been passed already in the run. So, no threat of that anymore. Uh, so that's why you will see in this uh, run, when approaching those enemies, both runners should be taking uh, hits, because uh, it's much faster to just lose about a half a second to uh, potentially crash in the game. Uh, there on Rinsky, you can see uh, them shooting straight up. You'll see that again here on Milkblade screen. Uh, that is another small little GameCube exclusive time save. The shot tracking seems to be a lot uh, looser and it'll track to enemies off screen on the GameCube version. Um, so they're able to use that to shoot an enemy that's off screen and waiting above them. Up next, we have a skip that's a relatively recent discovery. Um, there are some enemies called, uh, I believe they're pronounced Kanera. They're basically these bull looking enemies. Um, and by taking a wide line around some of them, you can actually avoid uh, them detecting you so they don't uh, rush out and hit you and push you out of the way or potentially kill you. Uh, the first one you can avoid. Uh, the next two are on a set cycle. The two after that you can avoid. Uh, last two are on a cycle. Then the last one uh, does detect you, but there is no way to actually get around its detection point. This looks like a pretty well done job, or well done job from both runners, uh, skipping the necessary ones there. And then up next we have uh, one of the biggest and one of the easiest uh, skips probably in the game and definitely in this level. Um, a very simple out of bounds uh, against a rock and a wall uh, which pushes you straight out and you're able to skip the last few rooms in this level and head straight to the boss arena. 
Uh, there are two methods to how you clip back inbounds. Uh, one of them is you can just clip back inbounds right next to the front door to the boss room and enter in that way. Uh, but that triggers a cutscene and is much slower. Or you can go for the route that both runners are going here. Uh, this is another inventive name called Oniwa Jump. Uh, this has a five frame window to jump it back in bounds without hitting the water or falling short. So I'm gonna let, uh, I'm gonna quiet up to let milk focus here. Both runners hitting that, very well done. Uh, again, that is a five frame uh, window. This game is a 60 FPS game, so you have less than a tenth of a second to time your jump. And if you do it right, you can clip back in bounds. If you are just a few frames short, uh, you can hit the water and that instantly kills you and your respawn back to where you clipped in uh, loses about 40 seconds. So very well done for both runners. Uh, showing why they are uh, two of the top three runners in this game. Uh, only three people have completed this game in under 40 minutes in either category. And you are seeing uh, two of them and hearing one of them. Uh, the pattern of the rocks they're pushing in here, uh, we call this the milk cycle, invented by none, none other than Milk Blade. Uh, basically, there is a, a certain pattern to when these uh, sort of vents open up, and you need to push the rocks into them when they're open. Um, so both runners doing a, a very, very tight timing uh, to push them in as fast as possible. Uh, basically, you push the first one, and then set up the second one, and then repeat until all of them are set up, and then you skip two and push in the final three. like Rin just pushing the last one as Milk is just starting it very, very close after over 20 minutes into the run, uh, which is awesome to see. So I'm going to listen in here. Uh, did not hear it from Rin. Let's see. Oh, heard it from Milk Blade. Nice. So right when the level starts, uh, you have about a two frame window to press the A button. And you know you can get the trick uh, if you hear they will go Hoop! from hearing him jump uh, right as the cutscene starts. Um, that is the very, very minor time save. It has a two frame window and it saves a maximum of a quarter of a second. Um, but basically it uh, lets you jump before the cutscene starts so that you can be airborne so you don't have to jump uh, to hit this uh, death warp just a fraction of a second earlier. You'll be seeing a few more death warps throughout this level. Um, basically this is the first half of Lewa's section. Uh, first being an adrenaline type level where you're grinding on the rails, uh, shooting the Matoran to collect them, and then uh, up next we'll have the flying section, which is one of the more fun parts of the, of the game. So here it's just about staying on the rails as much as possible. Similar to Kopaka, uh, staying on the rails uh, does let you preserve uh, more speed overall. And again, taking death warps to respawn uh, to save having to jump all the way back to the start. Each one saves a very amount of time um, from roughly three to four seconds to over 10 seconds, uh, depending on where you do it. Um, up next, there is a rather worrying part. There are some enemies that can hit you. Uh, so they'll be shooting at them to get them out of the way. Uh, if you do take a hit there, uh, you not only lose time to getting shot and slowing down, but you lose a little bit more time later on the last death warp because uh, you have to wait a little bit to fully respawn instead of just getting the reset last year back to your last checkpoint. Uh, very thick, sort of bluish-gray fog here. Um, that's just a, uh, a sort of feature of the GameCube version, uh, having a lot more fog and a lot more compressed assets. To come out very good first section for both runners. I'm going to be taking the final death warp here. Uh, that is the biggest uh, death warp time save there. So it triggers the cutscene immediately and puts you right back up where you need to be. Otherwise, there is quite a long path to uh, get back up and an entire section of uh, branches that you skip as well. So up next, we have, uh, like I said, the flying section. Liwa has the Mask of Levitation, um, so he has a flight ability. Uh, so both runners going to be going off to the left and hitting that jump leaf uh, and flying around to avoid a very long text box trigger that just basically teaches you how to fly. And from here on out, it's about optimizing uh, your line to save time. Um, not very many skips you can go for here, uh, just clean movement and uh, optimal jump time. So coming up in the next section, we do have a bit of a, uh, a donation incentive uh, that I set up. Uh, 
one of the uh, Bionicle Heroes runners, uh, first person to ever get a sub three hour time, uh, Footloose, ran this game and on his first playthrough hit that insanely difficult jump uh, in blind luck got it first try. Uh, so I put in $20 for both runners to attempt this jump here. Uh, again, it barely saves any time, but if either runner gets it, I'm putting in another 20. So let's see Rin approaching it here. So close, didn't get it. Milk Blade attempting it now. Oh, and he gets it! <laughs> There's my $20 gone. That is, again, incredibly difficult. Uh, it depends on the brown jump leaf that you land on. Uh, it basically bounces up and down a little bit. And if you jump off that when it's at its max height, uh, you can just barely make that jump. Uh, there you saw Milk Blade pause in the game. Here you'll see Rin do it now. Uh, when you pause, the vines uh, recoil when you unpause the game. Uh, still use that to bounce up and down to get enough height to clear this gap. Uh, right now, Milk is going through uh, what he calls Gibby Jump, and he yells Gibby every time during his runs. It's awesome. Um, <laughs> as a reference to Gibby falling from the ceiling in iCarly. Uh, there's a bunch of platforming you can do uh, during that section uh, off to the left, and some falling pillars that appear. Uh, you can skip all of that by just jumping off to the right. And now, uh, during this uh, pre-windmill section, uh, all three of us actually have a different uh, route we take through this room, um, but none of it saves or loses any time to each other uh, because we have to wait for this windmill cycle. So up next there is Panrak, the rock key. Uh, he's the boss we'll be fighting against later. Uh, but coming up, we have a very, very difficult and very precise jump uh, called Freebird. Uh, if you've seen the BD1P video on this game, you'll know what, I talk, what I'm talking about. Uh, basically, there is a text box that tells you how to fly behind this bird coming up, and there is a load trigger for the final area that is slightly bigger than the text box trigger. So what they're going to try to do is fly just close enough to hit the, the load trigger, but avoid the text box trigger. So see that coming up for Milk Blade here? That looked good to me. Uh, the camera can be quite finicky, because uh, it will uh, turn sharply when you're not really expecting it, and that can turn you back in towards the text box trigger. Uh, so we'll see Rin going for it here. Uh, this skip does have the potential to uh, actually make the, so the save file uncompletable. This area that Milk Blade's entering right now uh, is the final load zone. So if either runner misses the, uh, the load zone, this final area will not load. And if you get to the point where you can see whether or not it's loaded, you've already hit the respawn checkpoint. So if it doesn't load, your game is soft locked. You can't go back and uh, and go back to try to reload it. Uh, Rain there getting a very rare but really unfortunate uh, pattern. Uh, sometimes only the first of the three platforms appear, and that time only the first one appeared. Not much you can really do besides respawn and go for it again. Uh, I did hand out backup saves in the event that uh, either runner uh, got the soft lock, but thankfully both runners getting it. Uh, that's get very important. Saves about 17 seconds, I think. Uh, this final uh, boss that Rin is entering now uh, is very RNG dependent. Um, there is a two out of three chance that you can kill it uh, as fast as possible. And I think both runners did get that chance uh, if it either moves left or right. If it moves up, things get more difficult. Uh, it can basically only move to platforms adjacent to it. So you need to let it break platforms and you need to break platforms strategically in order to sort of trap it in a corner. So up next, Rin and Milk now in uh, the second Tahu level. Uh, Takua talking about the Mask of Light, again, one of the movie tie-ins. Uh, this is the second to last level, and we're only hearing about the uh, plot of the movie twice now. Uh, this level is uh, probably one of the more difficult levels casually, um, as it can... The, this enemy is uh, Kurak, the Ice Rakshi. Uh, it has some really wicked rubber banding and some crazy teleports it can do. Uh, so sometimes it can just teleport in front of you and speed away into the distance. Um, uh, it's basically just a point-to-point -point race from the start to finish. Uh, again, no checkpoints in these adrenaline levels. Um, and you just basically have to get to the end uh, before Kurak. Uh, if it does, it'll reset you back to the beginning. And uh, it can be very difficult casually, like I said. Um, it does a lot of unexpected teleports and unexpected movements. Uh, but thankfully, in a speedrun, uh, if you get one uh, route through the level that you know is good and fast, uh, it's pretty easy.
there is, uh, or rather there are a few out of bounds uh, glitches you can do in this level. Um, and one of the unique things about this game is different characters behave differently out of bounds. Uh, Gali and Onua, for example, um, I believe it's because there's a water level in those levels. Uh, they sort of float when they're out of bounds, whereas characters like Tahumata and Kopaka, uh, they will just fall into the void uh, if they clip out of bounds. In this level, Tahu Nuba can actually do both. Uh, if you clip out of bounds and uh, hold straight forward or any direction, uh, he will fall down into the void. But if you don't hold a direction, he will slowly move, but he will actually float. Um, this can be used to clip out of bounds and get to a different portion of the level. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the checkpoint systems don't quite like that and it doesn't save any time. Uh, probably needs some more testing and experimentation, uh, but it is possible. Another fun thing is that you can actually clip the camera out of bounds independently of the character. Um, so you can have the camera fall into the void while you're still going through the level, and that's not never fun. Uh, one of the only real uh, skips or time saves in this level is uh, during the uh, lava fall cutscene. It's very short. If you take an angle where you bonk the wall, uh, we see Rin going for it right here. Uh, if you bonk the wall after the camera tra transition, there. Uh, so Rin did that just barely, and it teleports you forward uh, instead of making you hit the wall. Um, and that can save around one second. They can see Karak being very annoying for Rin, uh, just getting in front of them. Uh, Milkblade just reaching the end of the level there. And now on to the final level. This is the showdown against Takuda, the big bad guy. Uh, basically in the lore here, Takua, the little red and uh, blue guy from earlier, finds the Mask of Light, goes on a big adventure to find the seventh Toa who's supposed to wear this mask. And then at the end of the adventure, he finds that he is the seventh Toa and he puts on the mask and becomes Takanuba, the Toa of Light, and faces off against Makuta. Uh, this level known for being a bit of a, uh, a time casino, you can either gain or lose a lot of time and it is uh, basically up to Makuta. Uh, as you can see, Milk struggling to kill that frog on the left, uh, the shot tracking not being very helpful there. Uh, the enemy patterns here, uh, coming up these flying enemies, uh, they can be quite annoying as they can fly around in different directions. Uh, they can actually get behind Makuta, making them unable to be killed. Um, so it's very, very difficult to, uh, to save time here intentionally. Um, there is a, ooh, we got to see an instant B from uh, Milkblade there. Uh, uh, still getting theories on it, but basically sometimes when you shoot at these uh, sort of wasp looking enemies, uh, they're normally supposed to break into two, and they do a flipping animation, uh, which wastes a few seconds. But uh, currently the leading theory is if you shoot them at a certain point when they shoot at you, they will instantly break into two, and they won't do that uh, flipping animation. Uh, and in that flipping animation, they are invulnerable to damage, um, so you basically just have to wait it out. Uh, here, Milkway not getting a good pattern with those wasps. wasps they're going in opposite directions. You have to go and run and chase them down. But that is the first phase complete. Ran on to the final step of the final phase, or the third phase as well. Thankfully, most of the RNG is out of the way. There is a, uh, a bit of a cycle to keep in mind uh, for the damage phase at the end here. We're in having a much better time at the, uh, at the final section than Milkblade, uh, mostly just due to the RNG of the game there. So here, Milkblade going to be going in, uh, going immediately to the left uh, to this stone, as it'll be... Uh, become flat first for any of the others. That's the fastest one to go for. We are coming up on time very soon here. This is the uh, second half of the final level. Uh, basically, you just have to step on these stones uh, to flip them over. And then once all four are flipped, you can reflect that projectile back at Makuta. Um, also, another thing to note is you'll see Takanuva actually just flying around uh, like Liwa. For some reason, they gave uh, Takanuva uh, flight ability, but I'm very, very glad they did, or else this platforming section would be much more difficult. Milk hitting the stanky leg there on the left, pulling out the dance moves as that platform rotates. Uh, so there is a bit of a cycle um, that they're going to be trying to manipulate here. Uh, basically, Makuta will shoot two shots uh, on the uh, final phase of this section. Uh, one of the shots is on a cycle, so that one there that just came out, then an, another cycle comes out, or another shot comes out, once the platform, uh, the last platform is fully flipped. Uh, so Milk avoided the first cycle, or the first shot in the cycle, and hit the second one from the platform flipping, 
uh, and that will actually make Makuta shoot at you faster uh, during this final part. So Rin uh, likely doing the same thing. Yeah, just taking the hit and reflecting the second one there. Uh, so time is going to come up very soon for Milkblade here. As soon as the camera transitions after the last hit, I'll go ahead and call that out. And time for Milkblade there. And Rin should be coming up immediately after. And time. Oh, no, one more, sorry. <laughs> one more cycle. It's getting the last hit in here. And time. Very great stuff from both runners there. Um, very, very good showing. Like I said, uh, these two, two out of the only three people to ever beat this game in under 40 minutes, uh, both doing it here right now on stage. And that was awesome. Very well done. Like a 38 from Milkblade, a 39, 16 from Rin, awesome stuff. Uh, I would have been happy with uh, anything sub 40 and having a low 39 uh, as the slowest run is very, very good. Uh, these two showing why they are absolutely uh, the two most talented people in this game right now. Uh, very, very great stuff. Uh, congrats, you two.